certain I reference certain figures that in the book that you might and I'm going to refer to them in a moment also but I'm just going to refer to them so there were three problems 5.7 5.9 5.19 5.7 .9, basically everybody's got that you know what are the various factors the k squared in the numerator the 1 plus k squared over 2 squared in the denominator the jj factor does anyone have a question on that um if not i'm gonna not spend time on 5.7 again because my understanding was everybody pretty much had that right okay so 5.9 is harmonics harmonics are an, an important feature of undulator radiation providing access to and i crossed out a bunch of words here providing access to higher photon energies than otherwise available. Okay, so there were just too many words there. It, all, it was all okay, all true, but confusing. So um, where's the question? What is the physical basis for harmonic wavelengths being shortened by a factor of one over n? So as the electrons go through the undulator, for every period, let's say in what we call the fundamental, the first thing we analyzed, as the electron goes through the undulator, for every magnet period, the electron makes one cycle of motion. So if there's 100 periods of the magnet structure, it goes through 100 cycles, right? But when we looked at the harmonics, we found that, for example, uh, when the electron in what we call the fundamental when the electron is going through one cycle of the magnet period okay if it's um uh how to say this as it's going through that one period we saw that actually we introduced um different harmonics first the second harmonic that's the first one we saw and what we what we observed there was that as the electron did one just one period uh, it did one cycle for one period in the x direction but in the z direction it had a double frequency to it so it actually did two cycles while the fundamental while the electron was doing one cycle in x it was doing two cycles in Z. So let's just start with that one. If you did a Fourier transfer, uh, if, you, if you look at that, how many oscillations in going through N, let's say N equals 100, it went in uh, at the fundamental frequency, it just went through 100 cycles. But how many cycles did it go through for the second harmonic? Neil. Sorry, <laughs> so I guess would you say it would be 200 cycles because it's 100 main cycles and then two harmonics? Yeah, in the z direction, in the z direction, the, the electron actually went through 200 cycles. So physically, that's the basis of it. And then we took it a step further and we found that there was a third harmonic. And in the third harmonic, for every single period for every period for, excuse me for every magnet period there was a triple a triple uh cycle there were three cycles so now when you look at the overall magnet structure rather than be a hundred cycles in the in this third harmonic there were actually three cycles for every one magnet period so when you look at the wave train that came out at that frequency it's going to have 300 cycles that's the physical basis of it. If you did a Fourier transform of a, of a wave train, which had 300 cycles rather than 100 cycles, it would be narrow. It would be more well-defined. So mathematically, that would come out. Yeah. Um, one thing that was confusing me was I kind of wanted it to be like the oscillations in X, which are the fundamental lead to oscillations in z which is the second harmonic and then that leads to more oscillations in x and sort of so on and so forth absolutely but then, correct. absolutely correct yeah okay but then i wanted it to in my brain i was like well then if there are 200 cycles in z yeah. 
then I want it to then double again. I want it to be 400 in X. You know what I mean? Like I wanted. Uh, yeah, it's not actually. So you mean like for the third harmonic? Yeah. Like I, I if, yeah. if like it fundamental is. is causing the second one, then mm -hmm. like it seemed logical to me that like, I know it's wrong, <laughs> but yeah. it seemed like it should be okay. that way. So it's a mixing problem. Um, in the first one, uh, it was, there was an omega of, of the, uh, let's just, I would associate in my head a magnetic period frequency, which I'll call omega, okay? It gets shortened, but it, there's an omega coming from the magnet period. And then when the electrons go through, they have an omega. And those two added up to the two omega. Now the two omega is still mixing with the magnet period of omega. So it's that two omega plus the, the magnet period omega. They're, at, they're the ones that are, at, um, um, are crossed to each other. And they produce the three omega in the other direction. And then the three, again, plus the magnet period gives us a four. So it's that mixing. It's always mixing with a, a clock. Uh, the clock set by the uh, magnet period frequency. Got it. So it's it's not sort of it's always like the nth fundamental mixing with the magnet. Sorry, the nth harmonic mixing with the magnet period leads to the n plus one harmonic. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, and just because of the v cross b, they're always they're always alternating in polarization. Okay, great. Um, so that answered what is the physical basis? Why is the relative spectral bandwidth within the central radiation cone equal to one over nn? Uh, meaning for the harmonic, why is it one over nn? Why not one over n? Okay. And um, what to say about that? That's a good question. Um, So, yeah, when ahead. I was looking at this question, um, I went back to where, why we ended up with a relative spectral bandwidth of 1 over big N in the first place. Um, and it's partially because we, we, def we put in a slit later to make it this. That's correct, right? Yeah. Um, but then we also said that it was... Um, so we defined our spectral bandwidth by the number of periods that the electron went through. So if we consider the number of periods that the electron or like went through, then this is just like a natural step from there, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's very helpful, thanks. Yeah, so I would say, uh, now I can see what, what the hand, why is the relative spectral bandwidth when the centrical one over nn? Because um, this is a narrower part of the spectrum. I and mean, we do the same analysis that we did before between what angle contains what, what part of the spectrum. And it's, it's narrower. Did I say that right? Um, let me punt on that for a moment because I'm not happy with the way I'm explaining it, okay? Um, okay. What average storage ring beam parameters might limit the achieved high harmonics spectrum? So the high harmonics are going to have this spectrum, 1 over nn, and um, a narrower spectrum because it had so many more cycles. So the harmonic has a narrower bandwidth, uh, relative spectral bandwidth now, rather than be 1 over n, be 1 over nn, little n, big n. And um, what, store, what storage ring would prevent us from actually achieving that? And the answer is this delta gamma over gamma, or gamma, the sigma value for gamma over gamma. But I, I could just call it delta gamma over gamma. So all the electrons in the ring don't have the exact same energy. Their, their RMS difference is about um, one in a thousand. So I would write that as delta gamma or, or gamma, uh, 
sigma gamma is the way the uh, accelerator people would write it. They would call it sigma with a, um, sorry, gamma with a subscript sigma over gamma. So what is that spread in electron energies, basically? And it starts out as one in a thousand RMS, but when you make it full width at half max, which is what we were quoting for the bandwidth, you always wind up multiplying by this factor 2.35. It's the conversion between a sigma value and a full width. So if delta gamma over gamma is one in a thousand, then full width at half max, it's 2.35 parts in a thousand. And so that's like one in 300, right? So the, in other words, this, the, the kind of spreads you're gonna get just because there are different electron energies in the ring uh, gives a, uh, a spread, a full width half max spread to anything of about one part in, let's say, 400. And so for our undulators, which have 100 cycles, that's not going to matter so much. But if we're looking at a, uh, the example I had in my mind was an, at the new ALS with the upgrade, they're going to have an undulator that has 150 periods. So in the third harmonic, that would have one over NN would be one over 450. And that's just about the spread in the electron energies. So they're gonna be about equal. So you're gonna see some broadening right there. Okay, if you go to the fifth harmonic, it's gonna to start to dominate a bit. Did I make that clear? Is my batting average rising or declining? Uh, sorry, actually, I had a question. So, so we know from part B, I don't know, we haven't really discussed that yet, right, that the relative spectral bandwidth sort of improves, right, as we go up in harmonics? It gets narrower. It gets the, narrower. The, the yeah. relative spectral bandwidth gets narrower. Okay. I think I then just misheard what you said a minute ago. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So... Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. So I'm going back now to the one that I wasn't, I didn't give you a good answer to. In 5.9b, by the way, I'm presuming you can see this, the Word document? Yeah. Okay. That uh, why, is, why is the relative spectral bandwidth within the central cone equal to 1 over nn? Ah, why is the spectral bandwidth? Um, uh, I think it's the same answer. Why is the spectral bandwidth one over n n? It's because of this just multiplicity problem within uh, not problem, but w one magnet period gives us so many more cycles. So that's gonna that's what's leading us to a narrower bandwidth. And we're only looking at the radiation within the central radiation cone. Um, the central radiation cone itself for these higher harmonics is going to be narrower as a result. Okay. Um, I kind of, as far as the like Fourier transform argument, yeah, was basically saying that like if the frequency is twice as high, um, so going from say like the fundamental to the second harmonic, yeah. then the Fourier transform will be twice as narrow, and that's where the like one over lowercase n comes from. Yes, exactly. Okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So let me I earmarked a bunch of pages. Yeah. So that those things would be seen uh, in Figure five seventeen on page one seventy two. We have a little bit about the harmonics. But then the Fourier transform business is shown on page 188, figure 521. It just shows this is a, you know, this isn't for fundamental or, or harmonic. It's just showing a wave train of n cycles, and it does a mathematics Fourier transform, and um, or Laplace transform would do here, and you get a certain width to it. And it's just because the more cycles you have, 
the better you define what the wavelength or, is or, you, or the, what the frequency is. The more cycles you have, the, better, the more accurate is your, um, your ability to count exactly what is one cycle or one wavelength. Okay. Okay, uh, there's another part here. What's the original? Okay, I, there's another part coming. So the next one I was going to go to is 519. And um, okay, so the ALS has recently received approval for an emittance upgrade based on a, a transition from the present triple bend acrimen, meaning at each intersection of, at, at the intersections of all the straight sections, uh, there's, there's actually three bending magnets, not one. And that's going to be replaced by a nine beam, nine beam multi bend, a nine bend, I should say a nine bend, multi bend acrimet. So there's going to be three times as many bends as there were before at each of those intersections of the straight sections. Okay, the electrons are coming through one, one straight section and they have to be deflected into the other. So there's a certain magnetic field there. And you could do it with a single magnet. But if you do it with a signal ma magnet, the, 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 the acceleration, the jerk on the electron is strong. And so with the current ALS, they break it up into three different smaller bends. And each one has less acceleration. And you don't get quite as much of a, of a, uh, a momentum kick to each of the electrons. That's what's producing the emittance to spread in the horizontal direction. That's what's making the beam look elliptical rather than circular. It's because of all those momentum kicks as the electrons go through the bends. So in the present one, they've gone to three bends, but in the new one, they're gonna to go to nine bends. And this is all these um, uh, upgrades that are going on. And the accelerator uh, studies have shown us that, or indicate that this emittance, this elliptical size of this thing, the elliptical spread goes as gamma squared over the number of bends cubed. So for gamma, the ALS is a lower energy machine, so gamma is not going to be much of an issue. The harder X-ray machines will not get to as close to a circle as the soft X-ray machines because their gammas are higher. But at any rate, what we're interested in here is that this ellipticity of the electron beam, this horizontal spreading depends on the number of bending magnets cubed. So we're tripling them. We're going from three to nine. And it says that that it's a cubic effect. So that means 27. So we're expecting to see a factor of reduction of about 27 in the horizontal limit. So the ellipse is going to go from whatever width it had before, eccentricity, it's going to be reduced by 27. So that's one of the factors. The ALS is hoping to get a factor of 100 improvement in its coherent power and brightness, and by the way, the two are related. If you remind me, I'll say a word later, but let's just say the coherent power. Um, uh, so there's several factors that they're hoping will increase the coherent power. So one is this uh, increasing number of bends is gonna reduce the, harm, the, the eccentricity of the ellipse by a factor of 27. Okay, um, what else would we like to do? Um, they're also going to increase the beam energy a little bit. And what else do I want to say? I think for the moment, I want to switch over to, to an equation. Yeah, so I'll leave this thing here for a moment. Whoa, what happened? There we go. So I'm going to close this just for a second. And every time I do that. So now I want to go here. Okay. So I presume you can see this, right? And this is slide number 46. Okay. And this is, this is one of the things that we derived in class. Oh, was a formula for the power in the central radiation cone. And this is an extension of that. 
uh, in, this is extended in two ways. Uh, this is an extension of if you have a, not only n equals one, the fundamental, but uh, for harmonics. So this, there's um, some extension of our previous formula, which is doing that. And we also introduced this JJ squared. We had not carried that through. It's a complication in the derivation, but it's not a gigantic factor anyway. It's usually of the order of 0.8 or 0.6 or something like that. So when you're trying to estimate how much power you're getting out of an, an undulator, um, that, that wasn't such a big deal. So I left it out of the development, but we're adding it in here, okay? And other than that, this is the formula for the power radiated, average power, and the central radiation cone for the harmonic N in a one over NN bandwidth. So the reason that we put that there is because for instance, for the fundamental, this would be one over N, let's say, okay, let's say one over 89 for one of the ALS undulators. But very often people want to express everything in terms of a one part in a thousand bandwidth, 0.1% bandwidth. So while I define this here, there'll be at times we'll want to change this to from, from a bandwidth one over NN to, to one part in a thousand. So for instance, for the third harmonic for that 89, for the N equals 89 undulator, it's three times 89. So whatever that is, a little less than 270, right? one part in 270, but still the synchrotron community for purposes of comparison uh, almost always quotes things in terms of one part in a thousand. So we'll see later that we'll make, we'll, it's just a simple multiplication to change this to one part in a thousand, okay? But anyway, this is our formula. And, um, and this is for the central radiation cone. And by the way, this photon flux here if you wanted to write this in terms of not power, but photon flux, you just have to replace this W. This W represents a watt, one watt. So we know we have a conversion efficiency, uh, not a conversion, we have a conversion between watts and photons per second, and this was it. So you just replace this W, wherever it went, this W here, by this number, 5.034 times 10 to the 15th lambda in nanometers. So if lambda was 2.5 nanometers, you would replace this by just 2.5, no units. The units are already photons per second. So that would take you from power to flux, um, which is a good place to stop, by the way, because that was one of the issues of confusion. Does, should I say more about that? You know, power doesn't tell you. Uh, it says how many watts, watts of radiation. Flux tells you how many photons, but the conversion between the two depends on what the wavelength was. If you have a longer wavelength, you, you get each, each photon has less energy. So there's going to be more of them, more photons, okay? Okay, so this was 46. I don't think I needed this. Yeah, well, this just has some... I found it convenient, I always find it convenient to, to look at the small k parameters to see how things vary analytically before we start going into numerical solutions. And that's what would happen in this next slide. But let, let me go back here for a second. We're now gonna take this formula and we're gonna say, okay, if that's the power in the central radiation cone, uh, how do we change, how, how do we modify it to get power in the, um, the coherent power, not just coherent, not just power in the central cone, but coherent power. So sort of remember this, this formula is gonna get repeated in a moment, but something is gonna happen. So I'm gonna go from slide 46 to slide 70, I think it is, or 69. Uh, I'm gonna to go to slide 70. So here's the repeated power in the central radiation cone. This is just the analytic formulation, and this is replacing all these E's and epsilon zeros, so it gives it a numerical value. So this is what we saw in the previous slide, and uh, in this case, you would put in um, the value of lambda. This means put in the value in centimeters. 
okay? And this doesn't say it, but you would put in I in units of um, amperes. So that's another mistake, as is shown here, for instance, okay? So this should have a bracket A, close bracket. Anyway, the coherent power is this power multiplied by the phase space filter, which is, which is this thing. This thing here, this is equivalent to saying, okay, we had some condition on d dot theta equals lambda, okay, or lambda over two pi. This, uh, this, uh, we're going to do it here in RMS unit, uh, RMS measures. So in both the, uh, the X and Y, both lateral directions, transverse directions, we're gonna compare our source size and divergence with lambda over two pi. It's a little confusing here because of these extra factors. Remember that the, um, the central radiation cone was kind of assuming that all of the electrons were going parallel to the axis, but in fact, actually there's some electron divergence so the real divergence of the source was a little bit bigger. In fact, uh, if we, if we could, were in a situation where the central co radiation cone which was considerably larger than the random divergence and the beam size sigma uh, was larger than this other correction factor, we would get what's shown in figure 70, slide 70. The coherent power, would look like what we had before, but it would be much simpler, okay? So what's the problem with that? Actually, with this part, there's no problem. Making the approximation that sigma prime, for, for instance, for an ALS upgrade, that this is so small, we could, that it's small enough that in the squares, we could neglect it and just put theta central squared, okay? That, turns out to be a fine approximation for the ALS for the whole range of operation because the central radiation cone angles are something like 30 microradians. And this is like five microradians, this natural divergence with the upgraded machine. So it's 30 squared 900 versus 25. You can forget this. So in fact, in calculating the coherent power, as a homework problem was asking, you, would, you, you could use this formula and leave this out. It would be a great simplification. It's okay. Okay, your, your percent, it's, it's be a small, less than a percent error. This one here, this correction, um, not, not quite so great. If you leave it out, for instance, at wavelengths of around one nanometer or 1.5 nanometers, leaving this out leads you to something like a 20%, 18% error, 20% error. But at longer wavelengths, like 4.5 nanometers or something, this can lead you to under, um, overestimating your brightness. It should be, this reduces things. A factor of two error is incurred if you leave this off. So on the homework problem to be, or if you just wanted to compare with accelerated people at the ALS, you'd use this full formula and, um, and, you, uh, and do the calculation. And by the way, this red star here is because in, I, uh, this is an updated version of this slide. The, the lambda slash uh, wasn't in the slide the last time I had posted it. <laughs> I just thought the four pi theta central was there, but it didn't have the right units, I noticed. This has units of nanometers, and this alone, the angle part, has no units. So anyway, this was missing. So that's what the star is, and you could correct that. So on the homework problem, or again, comparing to the facility calculations, which I was trying to do last year, I put, I put all of these things in. And I did the calculations and you can check me, they come in the slides after this, maybe 71 or 72 or 73. There are actually numbers I got. But if you wanted to do the homework problem, you could either do this completely and calculate the coherent power in the fundamental and let's say the third harmonic within uh, a 0.1% bandwidth, okay? Which is I think what we're asked to do. And, by the, and so we see that there's a switch here from one over NN to, uh, to this. That conversion from one over NN to 0.1% is just a matter of how wide is the slit you took. 
this slit is one part in a thousand. This is something not, this is, uh, so you're taking a narrower slice than this. This was one over, let's say 89 or one over three times 89, one over 270. So this is not as narrow a slit. This is a narrower slit. So to get from this formula, besides the coherent filtering, you would multiply this by just um, um, 0 0.01, uh, one part in a thousand divided by, uh, I'm sorry, NN divided by one part in a thousand. NN would be smaller than one than 1,000. So I'm sorry, you should multiply this by NN over 1,000. Say it again, <laughs> since I've offered it several ways. You would multiply this formula by NN over 1,000, which is less than one, right? It's NN would be like 89 or 270 or something over 1,000. That's all you have to do to change that little subscript there. So here, a couple of these moves have been made, and this is now the a straight formula that we could use to calculate things with some degree of accuracy. How good of an accuracy? Much better than a factor of two. So I've compared this with the ALS people, um, with Kwang J. Kim, if you know who he is, is the expert in the field. He uses uh, a different definition from central radiation cone, which I call Kwang J2 because the one I use is Kwang J1. Um, but at any rate, uh, when you compare these formulas for both coherent power and, or if you did spectral brightness, you get very good answers, much better than a factor of two. Now, if you were doing it for homework, you could do this whole formula and make a correction for each of these terms. However, um, if you, one, and for simplicity, to accept a certain error, just for the simplicity of it, you could certainly make this approximation, drop the sigma prime because it's so small, especially in the square, okay? This one, if you drop it, you're gonna run from a sort of 20% error for the shortest wavelengths to a factor of two error uh, for the longer wavelengths. But if you made those approximations, this is what the formula would look like and your homework problem would be so much easier, okay? So coherent power for the nth harmonic in a one part in a thousand bandwidth. So it says in the special case where these approximations are okay. This one is perfectly okay. This one's more marginal. And so these are the things that you, you would know for the ALS, they say that they're running at 500 milliamps, half amp. So this would just be replaced by a half. And the way, uh, there's a particular undulator that was picked out, uh, something like a 2.7 nanometer period. So you just put 2.7 here. Remember these brackets means just replace this whole thing by a number. So you've replaced this by a 0.5 and this by something like 2.7. Um, you, if you're going to plot this coherent power versus, let's say versus K, that would be one thing to do. So that's what I did actually. I did uh, values, several values, K equals a half, one, square root of two, uh, 2.98 I think was their biggest number. Um, I used the more complete formula, but this one would have been quite suitable. You have to look up this JJ factor um, and put in a number. Remember, uh, where did we have the definition? Anyway, it depends on K also. I think I have to switch back to 40 something. Yeah, uh, not so good. Oh, where is the X? It's on 46, it's in the middle of the slide. Uh, the X, oh yeah, sorry, thank you very much, appreciate it. Yeah, so the, you have to, for the different K values you're doing, you'll have to put in, um, you'll have to look up what JJ squared is, okay? So that's, it's simple enough to do, but um, it's a choice. And I think for just getting a, a rough number for the, uh, the answer of this thing, um, I would find it quite good. Your, 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 your error is, is gonna be um, 
at worst a factor of two at long wavelengths, but much less than that at the shorter wavelengths. So you're going to be you're going to be giving uh, you're going if you don't if you just make these approximation at the long wavelengths, your coherent power is going to be higher than it would be otherwise. So I'll come back here for questions in a second. But the second slide, the 71, has some general comments, but then it starts talking about um, using the ALS upgrade as an example. And it says using these equations. So these are the full equations, okay? A couple of changes have been made because it's, we already know the current and we know the lambda u. So those replacements were made. And this would be either power or coherent flux. Again, just replacing that watt by that number 5.03 times 10 to the something, 10 to the 23. And I came up with, so these are different numbers, which I did uh, a year or maybe even two years ago. But for instance, the, co uh, the coherent power in the ALS was less than a milliwatt in the old situation. And here's an example at the top where the coherent power uh, in the fundamental is almost a watt, 0.9 watts. So uh, the coherent, uh, coherent power went from less than a milliwatt to a watt. So it's pretty much, um, was, I said less than a milliwatt. That was because this is one over N. Um, at any rate, there are some numbers in here, and if you just look at one of the examples, you'll get some idea of uh, how these things evolved. So, yes. Um, anyway, uh, the conclusion at the end of this, I, it might have been at the next slide, whoops, no, uh, was that basically there was an increase of almost a factor of a thousand. And why was, why was it, um, so this brings us back to this case here. Yeah. We expect that this, why is this going up by a factor of, I'm sorry, of 100, not 1,000. Why is this going up with the upgrade by a factor of 100? Well, this factor here um, is giving us a factor of, um, Whoa, 20, 27, we said, was the maximum. They, I think they actually took 25. So um, am I getting this wrong? So they did actually increase a 1,000. This is 25 squared. There's going to be uh, an increase in the, the number of periods in the undulator. This, this uh, having a shorter period here of 2.7 centimeters or something like that. This, uh, the undulator that they based their numbers on had N equals 150 rather than 100, 150 rather than 89. So if you took a, a look at those numbers, that got you a factor of what? Uh, 2.8. So you had a 2.8 and you had this number squared and your gamma is increasing uh, for the coherent radiation, the gamma increased um, a bit. Uh, they went, um, I think it increased something like 1.1, but it's to the fourth power, so you got a decent. So those are the main factors of why they should have increased. Um, and Professor? Yeah. When we're looking at changes in sigma, isn't it only isn't it only a single factor of 25? Because sigma x got reduced by a factor of 25, but sigma y was about the same. So that is squared because it's supposed to be symmetric. But if it's asymmetric, yeah. we'd only get a single factor of 25 in there, right? Josh, you get two A's, two two stars for that one. Yes, I was sitting. I was. Um, it depends on the area. But this should be, uh, in their new area, it's the circle. So it's sigma, sigma. But you're right, we're comparing it to sigma x, sigma y. And so there's an increase of 25 here or 27. There's an increase here um, of whatever I said squared. And there's a gamma to the fourth factor. So Josh gets absolutely gold stars for that one. And I definitely appreciate it. 
But so you have one factor of 25, um, one factor of 2.8 for the uh, increased number of um, period, uh, yeah, n, the number of periods, and, um, and gamma, uh, what did gamma increase by? I think it goes from 1.9 to 2.0. And so if you, yeah. uh, if you raise that to the fourth, if you do two divided by 1.9 to the fourth, it's like 1.23. Okay, so 1.23. So, so 1.23 and 25, 0.23 times 25 equals n times, what did we say the other one was? 2.8. So it's 86. So that's saying that there's an increase of 86. And there may be some other subtlety in here because I remember when I did it, uh, it actually did come out to very close to 100. Um, I don't see where I say it, but it's did. And Josh, thanks again for saving me on that one. No. So somewhere in here it says it that it's about a factor of a hundred, which is what they were claiming. Okay, so that's what I wanted to to show you. And again, you have the choice if you want of um, uh, of resubmitting your homework if you want, or or leave it as it as it is. Um, this is not what I want either. I think. Um, can I ask yeah. a simple question? Yeah, yeah. Um, you talk about the magnetic tuning range of K going between 0.4 and 2.98. Yes. Um, I was a little confused about like what that means. Can you just speak to that tuning range for a minute? Like what that implies? Absolutely, but I'm looking, looks like I lost the Word document. Um, uh, let's see, sorry, I guess I have lost that. Say it again, uh, Lorena. Oh, the, the tuning range going from 0.5 to whatever they said, two point something. Yeah, I just, broadly speaking, I was confused about like what that means and what it uh, implies for our system. Oh, so they're going to have a magnet structure which they, with strong enough magnets that when they close, when they open it up, they could go to zero, but there's no power, so they don't open it up that. So they'll start at 0.4. That's what they're going to do their calculations for. But when they close it down further, they, the magnets are strong enough to get to higher K value, and that will drive harmonics. The harmonics start to appear... Um, uh, just above k equals one, so around the square root of two business where it's starting to roll over. The, the rollover is for a slightly different reason, but at any rate, harmonics start to get really strong for k equals two, and this is going up even higher. So they're trying to generate a strong third harmonic and, a, and actually a fifth harmonic. It's just going to allow them to go out further in, in photon energies with the, with the undulator. Okay, so Often people don't go as high as, as that, the two point whatever it was, because you're producing so many harmonics that there's a, even more power coming out onto your optics. Okay, and so, but anyway, that's, that's what it is. That's, that's the kind of range you could get with an undulator. Something around a half or 0.4 as they chose to something above the square root of two, so going up to two would be pretty good. Uh, maybe that's as high as maybe that's as high as they'll ever go, but the calculations went to a little bit higher than that. The, the magnet structure will allow them to go to even higher k, which means even higher harmonics, which may you know be they, they may be spectrally broadened a bit by the electron beam spread. Okay, any other comments on this one? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. I didn't hear. Uh, sorry, I think two of us spoke at once. Um, 
for brightness, the book talks about like the solid angle um, when yeah. you're calculating. Could you? I didn't really understand that concept, or, like what the solid angle was relative to like the angle. Okay, so remember that the radiation came out in a in a narrow cone, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so um, we calculated the power. We calculated the power in the within the central radiation cone, because that had a, a bandwidth we thought was interesting, right? We could have gone to a power in some smaller angle, but that seemed to have the right spectral bandwidth, um, uh, spectral width, yeah, okay. Um, uh, so that cone has a, has a relatively narrow half angle. And in fact, if you remember going back, this becomes interesting because of the coherence properties. The, um, the radiation coming out of an undulated is a lot of power, a couple of watts perhaps, and that power is within, um, it's coming from a small spot in the, to a narrow divergence. And we found that if you have a small spot and a narrow divergence, you could possibly have some coherent, a degree of coherency there. Right, so we're quite interested in a D and a theta. A D, um, but um, it turns out that actually we're not just interested in D, we're interested in the area. Where does the radiation, the power is being radiated out of what area, em emitted from what area into what solid angle? And in fact, when we define brightness, we say that the brightness is power per unit area or per unit solid angle. In fact, it'd be good if you wrote it down, just scribble it someplace. Power, brightness is power per unit area per unit solid angle. I'm sorry, brightness is power per unit area per unit solid angle. And area you could write roughly as pi d squared over four. And the solid angle you could write as pi theta squared where theta was the half angle. So you can see that your brightness is a power in a phase space, a D and a theta squared. And we have a relationship that if the D and the theta product gets small enough, this power is gonna be coherent. And in fact, um, uh, it, one of the other homework problems which we didn't assign was, it says, look at the spectral, the brightness or the spectral brightness, what happens when that d squared and theta squared satisfies that condition that we have for spatial coherence. And what you find is that in the limit that the brightness is within a cone like that, you see that it turns out to be the coherent power. So there's a formula, it's, a, it's just a simple algebraic substitutions. You'll see that the coherent power could be also, is equal to, uh, the brightness multiplied by lambda over two squared, or I should say the coherent power is equal to lambda over two squared times the spectral brightness. So if one goes up by a hundred, they both go up by a hundred. So, so that's where the solid angle comes in. There's an area with a D squared, there's a solid angle with a theta squared and, um, okay. And so to just historically, when the ALS was first proposed, it was not understood, it was not broadly understood. There were a few people on the face of the earth who understood that issue we were just talking about, and that in fact, the ALS parameters, the D and the theta were pretty small, and you could actually, if you put a, just a filter on it, you could get coherent power. And it was only after the ALS was initially proposed and rejected that that argument was brought back and it got the ALS funded. Okay. And after that, it caught on slowly at first. Now all the major facilities in the world are upgrading their storage rings to get uh, D and theta to, be, to yield greater coherent power. Okay, comments? Thanks for the explanation. Okay. Um, uh, hi, Professor. I just have a general question in, in chapter five. So, uh, in ARS, there is a special mode called two branch mode. 
Could you briefly introduce what's the speciality in the two branch mode compared to the multi branch mode? Yes, sure. So the electrons going around the ring, we were talking about how some of them lose energy because they radiated and some lost less, they didn't radiate as much. And so that as the electrons go around the ring, it starts to be a little spread in gamma. And so there's an, uh, uh, a microwave, radi really a radio wave cavity that's put in the ring so that any late arriving electrons get a little electrical kick, axial electric field, to, so that they catch up in energy. And that uh, oscillating radio frequency is at 500 megahertz, so it's giving kicks at 500 megahertz for any electrons who come a little late. That, that keeps the delta gamma over gamma where it should be, okay? Uh, but that 500 megahertz also puts in a sort of um, a bunch of potential wells going around the ring. It's like there are these potential wells going around and every two, they're separated every two nanoseconds. So they're going around the ring. And so there are what they, and the accelerated people call them buckets. So the ALS would have something like 400 and something buckets. Okay, they're all moving around at basically the speed of light around the ring and they put electrons into them. So normal operation is to put electrons into most of the buckets. Actually, there's a reason not to fill them all, but maybe three quarters or even more of the buckets uh, in a long, long arc would be filled. And that's where our normal operating uh, synchrotron would be. And so we'd get a lot of, and the more buckets we fill, the more, more power out we get average per cycle, of per second, let's say, okay? But sometimes people would like to do a pump probe experiment. So they only want two, two buckets filled as uh, sort of on opposite sides of the ring. So that the, uh, the only, so we're getting radiation now, not at 500 megahertz, uh, not every two nanoseconds, but now there's only gonna be two pulses for every, every trip around the ring one of them will be used to pump some scientific experiment, to, to pump a transition in, uh, in some atoms, okay? And they'll be tuned to those atoms that they wanna pump. And the second pulse coming around will be used as a probe. So, so for instance, uh, some people looking at molecular dynamics, um, the, uh, the two the two bunch operation allows them to, to uh, do something to the molecules in, with the first pulse and the second one to probe it. And then they just keep repeating that at 500 um, megahertz. Good enough? Yeah, thank you. Okay, anyone else wanna say something? Okay, so that's all I had to say about the homeworks. You heard what your freedoms are and I'm, just glad that we had the opportunity to go over it again and thank everyone for helping with the mistakes or the things I was struggling with. Josh in particular, that was a good one. I was, I was really um, searching to figure out where, how I made that. It wasn't clear, it wasn't clear to me until you said that. So that was great. Okay, so we have about 25 minutes left. So we're not gonna get to where, was. what we'll do, last time I, I did this also, we went over this, okay, how does, what did we learn about the FELs? Uh, and I did that because we outlined the math, but it was certainly not possible to follow real time. And I wasn't really pressing you to go into the chapter and read the details of the math. I wanted you to have the general concept of how this works, physically what's happening. So this slide, I guess I could just, um, go to slideshow, why not? So this slide gives us a physical idea of why, there's, why a bunching might happen. Okay, so we have all these random electrons. Now we're talking about an FEL. It's very long. It has a small lateral area, so coherence interference will start right away. And it has more electrons per bunch, so there'll be more radiation and all of that. And then we say that, well, within the larger electron 
um, beam, uh, there is an, at a certain point the appearance of what looks like a small electron wave shown here in purple. And it's the whole diagram is shown twice. Once, uh, um, so this is, this is the x-rays, okay, lambda x, okay? And it is at the x-ray wavelength that the micro bunching appears. And some electrons get it in the region of this little wave that appeared. And then maybe we saw that maybe other little microwave, um, <laughs> that's not a good phrase, small nanoscale electron bunches appearing elsewhere, electric fields, uh, x-rays with a short wavelength. There might be a few other places where there's a few cycles appear with a decent amplitude, you know, thousand out of 10 to the eighth electrons, maybe a thousand of them just happen in some places statistically to produce a wave like shown here. And that little wave will move with the electrons uh, throughout the undulate. There's only going to be a small shift of one wave per, per um, magnet period. So these are going to travel, they're both traveling at almost the speed of, one at the speed of light and one almost the speed of light. And so electrons which happen to be located in a region where the electric field is positive pointing up get a kick and they go off axis a little bit and a little slower to come back. So electrons which, the number of electrons which would have followed the heavy black line would have been here, they've been deflected. So there's more electrons over here and there's less here. And at the same time, uh, a different, just looking at this same region, but here, what about the electrons which were in a region where the electric field was pointing down? And that's shown as giving the electrons a kick in the other direction. So they, they don't go, they don't go uh, as far off axis as before, they come back sooner. So there's just the opposite effect. Okay, there's gonna be more electrons here, but also less electrons. Both, both of these lead to less electrons at the original crossing point and a few more electrons either ahead or behind. So this causes the micro bunching, okay? And, um, and that energy transfer is because there's a V dot E, the, the electron has uh, a component of its velocity going off axis and it's matching with the electric field of the emerging FEL wave. And this is the energy equation. Okay. So, um, so, okay, so then we said, okay, that's physically motivating us as to why things are happening. Let's see what we can learn um, analytically about the process. And so we looked at the equations of motion and we looked at for the, for the particles, the electrons, both the momentum equation, uh, what we would look like classically, we would say it's the force equation, F equals MA, but there's a rate of change of momentum equation and rate of change of energy. And in the rate of change of energy equation is always this V dot E, but the V we solved in chapter five and we can replace it here. The E stays with all of this and this angle factor had to do with um, the difference between uh, the positions of the maximum of the electric field and the position of the electron. So it's just a, a positional thing. Uh, in fact, if we went back to the previous slide, it would be the difference here. Why is one electron getting a kick one way and the other, the other electron getting a kick the other way? That's what this factor is about, okay? Anyway, there are two equations of motion for the electrons and there's a one dimensional wave equation. And we didn't say that this was a little bit of work to understand, to get to, to get this analytic result, but it is in the book and it's partially in an appendix, but there are three equations that we're going to solve simultaneously and without going through how to solve them. These were the particle equations. Okay. And we substituted, we made some, uh, uh, as mathematicians do, <coughs> introduce parameters which scale easily. Okay, and then the wave equation, the one-dimensional wave equation, and those all got combined. So these were the th those original three equations: the two particle equations and the wave equation. The one-dimensional wave equation look like this, but they have nonlinear terms. They have product terms. So this one has a product of 
uh, electric field and theta. This is again uh, the the phase difference between the particle and the wave, and um, and this is also nonlinear. So we needed to linearize the equations, which we did. Uh, for instance, here, this was approximated by one, et cetera, and the theta. And so we have our three equations, two equations of motion and the wave equation, and we combined them and <coughs> for this electric field. And the wiggle on top meant that it was a complex quantity. It had both a phase, which would be, uh, we would normally have written as just E zero or something or E, but it also has uh, a growth or damping possibility. And so in combining these three, we find that the three combine to a, um, a third order equation. And it's a simple third order equation. And there's some parameter that comes out of all of these constants out in front, which is called gamma. Uh, which we're not going to spend much time with because some other parameter is going to evolve from this, but there is some parameter. It has all of these factors mixed into it. And then we want to solve this equation to see how does the X-ray electric field, how does the electric field of the X-ray change with propagations in the Z direction down, down the tube? Okay. And so we substitute, we uh, we assume a solution for e sub, x, e sub x that it has some starting amplitude and some e to the mu z, which uh, mu is undefined at this point. We're going to substitute this into the previous equation. When we do that, we find that the mu depends on this same gamma that we saw before and an i. And so we, wa we want to solve for mu so we can put it up in here in the exponent. We take the <laughs> cubic root of this, there are three solutions. Okay, uh, one solution, uh, it has an imaginary, has an I in there. So when we put it up here, this is a pure, pure oscillation. It is a wave that just oscillates, continues to oscillate up and down, no damping and no growth. Then there are two others, which also have an I. So they're both propagating. They both have an, an, uh, an I kz here. So they're both, these are both propagating waves, but they have different signs on the, um, the, the, the real part, okay? And it's the real part. And so one of them is going to give a damping rate. That wave, as it propagates and oscillates, it will damp down in amplitude. This one is going to grow. It's going to oscillate at some frequency, but it is going to, um, to grow in amplitude. And the growth rate depends on this gamma. Um, but uh, um, if we write that the, um, now we can write, we substitute this into here. We'll say that the, we'll see that the electric field has this amplitude. It has some oscillation <coughs> and it has an exponential gain. It's increasing. The electric field is increasing. Okay. Power is proportional to E squared. So we square this, square modulus, square the modulus of this, and we get that the power depends on the initial, as a function of z, depends on the initial electric field. So we have to put some other constants in here to make it power units, but it's proper. And it has an e to the z over lg, where these things are combined into what is called a gain length. So it has a power gain length. In other words, um, a dis for a distance z equal to lg, just when z equals lg, this is one, that means the power has increased by a factor of e. And that's what they call a gain length, okay? And the gain length is shown here. And it depends on this parameter, rho FEL, which had all of those, um, all of these things went into this rho FEL. So this is a gain length. And this was the first part of this um, uh, uh, primary paper by Claudio Pellegrini and others. Okay, so here's the gain length and here's what rho is. And you can see it has a k squared in it. Um, it has a, we call it k caret, k caret to include the jj term. So we don't have to keep carrying this around squared. And it depends on the electron density, the undulated period and gamma cubed. So it's a complicated thing, but the 
quite amazing thing is that it turns up in everything for the FEL. It turns up in what is the gain length? What is this exponential distance? What is the distance in which it starts exponentiating? It turns out if you do uh, a Fourier transform of the, the growing wave, so this would, by the way, uh, you'll also find that the bandwidth also depends on this rho FEL. So the delta omega over omega um, also depends on this rho FEL, okay? And we'll also find out that the saturation power depends on rho FEL. So this was a major paper where, uh, whereas FELs were understood physically before to somewhat, to some degree mathematically, all of a sudden, everything could be expressed in terms of one parameter. It was a great breakthrough. Uh, this thing, by the way, I forgot to tell you, I said this was a standard, mm, this is a standard Fourier transform pair. But what I didn't tell you was that you could look up. This is, if you looked at it, it's, this is, had time going the other way, this would be a damped oscillator. If this was started with some amplitude and time was going to the left instead, this would be a damped oscillator. It's an electronic, uh, it's an oscillation that, for instance, would occur in ele electrical circuits. And so people have um, analyzed Fourier transform this long, long ago and gotten that it's a, it's a Lorentzian, as shown here. This is what a Lorentzian looks like, okay? Uh, but so all I did was I looked up, I got the idea that all I had to do was take the damped oscillator and turn it around in time, and that would be, an amplifying wave, which is what our FEL is. I just put in the frequencies and did the Fourier transforms. And in terms of full width at half max, <coughs> the bandwidth comes out to this two square root of three FEL. And this is, this is a one dimensional model. So that it's missing some things, which, and it's, um, but it's perfect actually. And in terms of RMS quantities, this would, this would come out to roughly 1.5 FEL. And if you read review papers of FELs of how they work, they will not tell you how to derive the bandwidth. They will just say that the RMS spectral bandwidth is a wiggly FE, uh, rho FEL. They won't put the 1.5. They'll just say it's roughly one times rho FEL. Okay, so now we've seen that the FEL, you know, we started with, we have a physical model, we started 1D anal, uh, analytic development using the three equations and these three equations. And uh, we find an FEL parameter, we find that the gazing, the lasing gain length, power E folding, is just this in terms of uh, rho FEL. Um, what I haven't shown you, but is true, is that the saturated lacing power is the is the same FEL parameter times the energy in the beam. So this is the current divided by E is the number of electrons in the bunch, and this is the energy for each of those electrons. So this is the total energy in the electron bunch, and the saturated power is that times rho FEL. Okay. And this is the way the accelerated people would write the spectral bandwidth. Okay. okay. So we went over some of these first experiments at Stanford, what the parameters were. I don't think I need to go over them again. Right? Um, what do we have here? So typical powers. An operational power, they're quite normal, is 15 gigawatts. And uh, this is for a hard X-ray. So a hard X-ray undulator, for instance, at Argonne National Lab would have about 10 watts of power in the central radiation cone. And this is 10 to the ninth higher. So the FEL is putting out a power that's 10 to the ninth times higher. And that's sort of consistent with the number of electrons in the bunch. You know, we've so we're going from the undulator at argon. The electrons are random, and they're radiating 10 watts. But if you get those 10 to the eighth or 10 to the ninth electrons to radiate collectively, so the electric fields add. Now you get an intensity depends on 
the number of, not the number of particles, but the number squared, that's where the, the gain, a, a good part of the gain is coming from. That you've got a coherent addition of the fields from basically all the electrons. Um, one thing, however, uh, and also this, all the radiation is coming out in a really narrow pulse. This one, in the early experiments, this is what they estimated it or measured it to be. Um, so many femtoseconds, full width at half max. Uh, now they typically operate a little bit less than that. It depends on the experiment. And um, the people at Sakla in Japan nominally operate at 10 femtoseconds. Other people, a little bit different. Okay. Here's the gain length, 3.5 meters. And the, the, the Stanford LCLS saturates, what is the length at which they reach saturation where the power just starts to level off? It's 60 meters. And that's interesting because they have almost twice that. Okay, so that gives them some freedom to do some interesting things um, uh, where they actually go to saturation halfway through and do some filtering before they use the other half. Uh, this was just to remind us that the bunch length, for instance, at LCLS is long enough that it can handle about uh, several hundred, around 300 of these micro uh, waves, electron waves, each one producing an X-ray pulse, okay? So the power coming out is going to be in all of these little bunches and they, have, they could have slightly different frequencies within this sort of bandwidth that's allowed, which is for the, for LCLS is something like one part in 300. Within the one part in 300 relative spectral bandwidth, they'll have a lot of spikes. Within, so one of these lines is, is a single shot. And this is showing that in that single shot, the spectrum showed a bunch of little spikes. These are all little spikes. They're representing those little micro, wave, micro bunches within the big bunch. So the big bunch was, um, I forget how long, um, but at any rate, within it were many, many micro, micro bunches, each radiating, radiating separately. And since it starts from noise, every shot looks different. So that each one has a different spectrum to it, okay? And so what they have done is They've taken their long undulator, and since they can get to saturation in half of the, the length of the thing, they'll get to this nicely defined wave. They then put a, a diamond crystal in transmission. The, the radiation goes through the crystal. The electrons a, have a magnetic field, a so-called chicane, that deflects the electrons so they don't destroy the crystal. They go around, and then it comes back again. Uh, this crystal, is a spectral filter. And so this thing is, this is producing all of these little spikes, uh, but this crystal is going to choose a really narrow band there, uh, something like one in 20,000. So at hard x-rays, crystals can be uh, very efficient and they can produce very narrow bandwidths. And so the, after the radiation goes through this thing, doesn't, it's not going to support all those spikes anymore. In fact, there's only a few of them going to come through, and those few are going to act like a seed. So here, you won't start from noise in the second section. You'll start, you won't start from something like this. You'll start um, with a, a driving wave, okay, which has survived this crystal. It certainly lost power coming through this crystal. It lost a lot, but it is a wave which can drive the process. And as a result, um, the, the, you will go from a situation, uh, the normal operation shown in red, what's called SASE, okay? And if you go, but in, in, instead, if you go through the, the diamond crystal, you get a much narrower spectrum. It's not, it's not only one pulse. You notice the blue things, there's a couple of spikes, but you've greatly reduced the number of spikes that there are, okay? So that's what's called um, self-seeding, okay? It greatly narrows the spectrum of the radiation and they didn't lose much power. The, the, the energy, uh, I forget if you divide it by how many femtosecond 
femtosecond pulses are, the pulses are, this would give you a power. But basically, they've got more or less the same power, uh, but in a much narrower spectrum. So if you're doing a spectroscopic probing of some material or excitation, this would be a great, great, this is a great, great advantage. Okay. And so uh, I think we said something about coherence. I'll come back to it next time. But there were questions. So did I speak about these coherent slides? I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah, they're basically Young's double slit experiments um, that showed that the spatial coherence of the undulator was as high as everybody thought it was. It was just confirmed that. Um, uh, this is Sakla in Japan, uh, which I'm going to say something about in the next slide. I'm going to point out how they used uh, long sections of their undulators, one with one value of k and one with one va a different value of k, and that allows them to do really interesting pump probe experiments where they're different photon energies, which you could not do at SLAC for many, many years. They just uh, have uh, obtained that capability now. But this has also allowed the SACLA people to produce a first X-ray laser, which we're going to talk about. Um, but also, I wanted to mention, there was a question last time, what about seeding in general, seeding with a laser? Well, for the, the X-rays at 8 kilovolts, like SLAC or SACLA, we don't have a good source for a natural laser seed uh, at that energy. But um, where is this? This is at, uh, ah, here we go, at Fermi, the Fermi uh, fr uh, free electron laser, which operates in the extreme ultraviolet is where their best performance is, a little bit into the soft X-ray region. It's associated with the synchrotron called Electra. They're all in Trieste and they're all connected. And this is what I want to talk about in the next lecture. I'll go over what they do at SACLA and I'll go over how, um, how they seed with a tie sapphire laser. They triple the tie sapphire laser to a shorter wavelength of 240 nanometer. And then they use a technique called high gain high harmonics to get um, and they do it twice to get the very short wavelengths from a seed. So that's what we'll talk about at the next class. Okay. Okay. Any questions or comments? No questions, no comments. Okie doke. Well, I guess I guess we're okay then. Again, thank those who chipped in with questions and those who chipped in with good observations. And again, Josh for the sigma squared being sigma x compared to sigma x, sigma y. Um, but there were several other places where I was hesitating. And Neil, thank you for asking lots of questions as you do. Okay. So see you all on Thursday. See you. Thank you. Yeah, bye.